So good afternoon everyone. This is our series on the gospel and we're now in, uh, this is now number nine in the series and this will be a, a just a continuation of the last study. There we were in the book of Galatians and we got up to Galatians chapter 3 verse 24. So we'll just read um, verse 23 and 24 again and then we shall round off this chapter and then we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 to continue. We want to make a couple of points yet in Galatians chapter 3. So it says in verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So we talked about that in the last study. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And we also discussed that one. But the law is pointing out what our situation is. And that is supposed to bring us to Christ. Now this law can be either the moral law, which is the Ten Commandments, or it can be the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament were all pointing towards Christ, who was to come. But when Christ came, those laws were done away with because the types of um, the antitypes and the types were all fulfilled in Christ. But the moral law, which is a transcript of God's character, is eternal because God is eternal. Therefore, while there is God, there is also always going to be a law. Now, in the future, this law will be such that we will hardly know that we're keeping it because we will be so in tune with God. But nevertheless, there is a law there which is, if transgressed, would once again create sin. So the moral law is eternal, but the ceremonial laws are temporary as were the laws of Moses as far as civil laws. For instance, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was a civil law. But God really wants us to love our enemies. So if someone lost an eye, we should forgive, be prepared to forgive. But back in the Old Testament, they had an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth because if one eye was lost, then the person who lost the eye, his relatives might take out several eyes of the others or kill them, and even if it was an accident. And so God made one eye for an eye and one tooth for a tooth to stop people from taking revenge way over the um, normal retribution for something that was done to someone else. Now, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now, some people, when the law convicts them, the law says, you shall not kill, the law says you shall not steal, the law sh says you shall keep the Sabbath holy. Because they don't want to keep the law, they want to throw out the law and say that the moral law is nailed to the cross. But the, law, the moral law is eternal and it will always be there. 
But as far as a legal requirement, perhaps you could say that it is um, nailed to the cross because the law is written in our hearts when we are converted. And so as an external thing, it is not so strong because it is in our hearts. And a good example of that is smoking, for instance. Before we are a Christian, we might be smoking, we might be drinking alcohol. Now we can, in our society and in most societies today, you can't smoke in an airport or on an aeroplane. So before conversion, we could say a person might be a smoker and they get that urge to smoke in the airport or on an aeroplane. And the law says that you can't smoke on an aeroplane or in an airport. And that law is there for good reason. And so people who want to smoke, the only reason they don't is the fear of retribution, the fear of a fine, the fear of imprisonment, the, the fear of being thrown out of the airport or whatever, missing their flight. But if you were a smoker and now you're not a smoker because you realise the reasons concerning your health why you should not smoke, what does that law, what difference does that law make to you when you're in the airport or on the plane? Makes no difference whatsoever because you are not a smoker anyway, because you, are, you have no desire to transgress the law which says you shall not smoke. So when the law is written in, a heart, in our hearts and we are in tune with that law, then it's natural for us to do what is right. Now some people want to throw away the law Okay, well, let's talk about a thermometer, for instance. And this will illustrate the point of throwing out the law, as some people think. It's a very hot day. We have a thermometer. It is a very hot day. And the temperature goes to, say, 40, 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. Or, we'll say, 110 to 120 Fahrenheit. And that is very hot, as you would imagine. Now... Let us think of the thermometer as being the law. The thermometer is only telling us the true condition of the heat on that day. So here we are on that particular day. So the thermometer is telling us what the heat is what the real situation is. But if we do what some people want to do with the law, we break the thermometer. We break the thermometer. Does that change the temperature in which we are working? And the answer is obvious. It doesn't change the temperature at all. The temperature is the same. So instead of breaking the thermometer, because the law is holy, just and good. Or another place, it says in Romans 3.3, 3, Do we make void the law through faith? 
No, we establish the law. So by faith we establish the moral law. We establish that the thermometer is correct. Another one which says the same thing is found in Romans 6 verse 1. Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? It says no, we don't. How can we continue in sin? So the solution is not to destroy the thermometer. The condition is to bring the heat down around us in some way. And in the Christian walk, the way to bring that heat down is through Jesus. To bring the problems in us under control and the problems outside us under control is through Jesus Christ and the gospel itself. And that will bring the heat down to a regular basis. So I think that point is clear uh, when we understand it correctly. Okay, let's go on now. Verse 25. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So when the When the temperature is brought down by Jesus, we no longer need the thermometer because the temperature is okay as long as we stay in Christ, as long as we allow Christ to work in us. But we'll come back to this point a little bit later. While the relationship's good, we don't really need the thermometer. But if we step out of our relationship with Jesus, once again the law or the thermometer will say, Hey, what's going on? Why are you doing this? And that's not in harmony with Jesus. And so therefore the law will again enter and pull us up and tell us we are not acting correctly. Now we read verse um, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So this is the point that Abraham's seed is Christ's seed. In other words, if we have Christ's seed in us, we're truly a child of Abraham. But if we only have Abraham's physical seed in us, then we may be a child of, Abraham, of Jesus, a child of Abraham as well, but we are only normally a child of Abraham uh, physically, but not spiritually. So the true children of Abraham are those who are Abraham's children in the spiritual sense. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians, which is linked very much to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll start at verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? So Paul is saying, do we need to start again? Do I need to be reintroduced to you? Verse 2, he clarifies his meaning further. 
You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So we are to be an epistle of Jesus because they were to be an epistle of Paul because Paul represented Jesus. And we are to be an epistle of Jesus Christ. And that epistle is something that is showing the character of Jesus. When we walk around, we should be showing the character of Jesus. Be a living epistle, a living letter. Let's read on. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, written, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. So once again, it's bringing back the same sort of point. There's two ways that we can have the moral law. And one is a, is a basically a lesser representative representation and the other is a very powerful representation. So here we have the Ten Commandments. written on stone. And here we have the Ten Commandments. Written in the heart. We want to see that these are two different experiences. And Paul wants us to understand that they are two different experiences. Now, when the law when the law is written on tables of stone, do tables are tables of stone a living thing? Now let's put this down. Is that living, those tables of stone? We have to say no. But is the fleshly tables of the heart living? We have to say yes. Okay, so here we are in the middle. Now, there's two ways we can keep God's law. We can keep it written on tables of stone. And if it's written on tables of stone... Maybe I can just improve this um, a little bit here, my diagram. If it's written on tables of stone, in our hearts and in our heads, then... It's not a living thing. We do things because the law says so. You shall not be angry. You shall not steal. You shall not lie, etc., etc. So the heart has a strong tendency 
to want to steal something. But because the law says you shall not steal, the person refrains from stealing. You shall not hate. The person refrains even though they feel like hating someone, like hurting someone, they refrain from hurting them because the law says so, or else they may do it anyway. Now, the law of Ten Commandments written on stone has a, is a preventive way. It is restraining, we can say, restraining. Let's put it that way. So the heart is restrained. by the word of the Ten Commandments. Okay, can you see that? Now let's look at the other picture that we have here. So I'll make two people, and here we have the second person. Here the heart. The heart of God is changed, has changed the heart of man. So God is love. So love is imparted to the person. So when it says, you shall not hate, you shall not kill, you shall not lie, the person, because their heart is changed by Jesus, the likelihood of doing those things is far less because they can choose to do them still. They still have choice. But because love is the principle of action in this person, it is unlikely that they will go down in that direction. Although anyone can fall into sin, even if they have been redeemed by Christ. But here, the basic character of the person is changed and the law is written in the heart. So there we have a comparison between the two. This person loves because God is love. This person still doesn't love but they restrain themselves because they know God doesn't want them to hate but they don't express what is really in the heart. So you can see there's two different situations there. That's why, let's read it again. <coughs> Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. So here we have, the New Testament. Okay? Now, not of the letter. Here we have the letter. Now, Paul experienced both these things. We have Paul before conversion and Paul after conversion.
Paul was a changed man to a huge degree after conversion. Our experience may not be as, well, won't be probably almost certainly as powerful as Paul's because Paul's was very exceptional. But the potential is there for it to be that way. But still, we should be able to see these two principles at work. We don't do away with the law, but instead the law is in our heart. And so we come into harmony with the law at conversion. We want to be obedient to Christ. The power of bondage, the power of sin is broken. And God it puts his spirit within us and the seed of Christ is with us. So verse 6, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills. So this way kills. Now why? Because look at the Pharisees in the time of Jesus. They outwardly showed um, the keeping of the law. They were very strict about the Sabbath. They were very strict to refrain from swearing, blasphemy, all these things. They paid their tithes, all those things. And yet inwardly, Jesus described them as ravening wolves. And Paul described them as whited sepulchres. Or maybe that was Jesus, I'm not sure. I just have to recheck that. But yes, I think that might have been Jesus. It's either Jesus or Paul. Anyway, whichever one it was, it was a clear description. Now, a whited sepulchre is something that looks good from the outside, but is full of dead men's bones within. So outwardly they looked good, inwardly they were corrupt. But here we have the inside has changed and this will gradually radiate to make the whole man in harmony with God if we allow God to work. Let's go to verse 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceeding in glory. So here we are comparing Mount Sinai, which this is a symbol of Mount Sinai, which is still in bondage. It compares Mount Sinai with the new experience of Jerusalem, we can say, or can say Christ within. This was glorious so that when Moses went up onto the mount, he came down again, his face was uh, bright with the glory of God from that communion with God and when the people saw his face they wanted him to cover his face because of the glory that was there but when if that was glorious how much more glorious when Christ is within the hope of glory when Christ is our seed within then the glory will be greater. Now this is described as a ministration of condemnation because the people said 
all that the Lord has said we will do. Because the Ten Commandments said, don't make any graven image, don't commit, um, don't worship idols. And yet, when Moses went up into the mount, they did those very things. So it wasn't a heart experience. It was still only an external experience. And because they weren't truly keeping the law, the law was condemning their thoughts and their actions. And that was a very unpleasant thing for them. And it was a ministration of death to them. Because what they wanted to do, they were not able to do. That is the Romans 7 experience here. Romans 7. And this is Romans 8. And they are different experiences, even though they have some things in common in some ways. Okay. Let us read on. We'll go to verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. So they caught, still can't understand the relationship of the tables of stone to the fleshly tables of the heart that Christ is to dwell within. God in Christ dwelling within our hearts by faith. Let's read verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So once we understand this, if we continue to direct our thoughts to Christ as the living representation of the law. But this is how we become overcomers. We become overcomers from by taking our eyes from the law specifically and bringing our eyes onto Jesus Christ. By making Jesus Christ the picture of the authentic keeping of the law, then we become assimilated into the image of Jesus. Because Jesus came to magnify the law and make it honourable. Jesus also said, Think not that I have come to take away the law or the prophets. I have not come to take away but fulfill. So Jesus came to fulfill the law as an example to us of how the law of God is to be kept. And this is the truth that the law is eternal. Let's continue now with um, these thoughts by going to the book of Hebrews. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8. I think we'll begin.
Okay. Let's go to verse 8. But finding fault with them. Maybe we'll go back to verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So this is talking about Moses again. If you want to back up further, you're welcome to in your spare time. But basically it's talking about the old covenant. Obey and live is the old covenant. But we want to come into the new covenant and see the difference. So let's go to verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So in these last days there will be a new covenant, from the time that Jesus rose from the dead, in particular, but here again in the last days, this new covenant will become more fully understood. It was understood by the apostles, but it will be more fully understood than the generation since the apostles as we come to these last days. Verse 10. For well, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their heart. So this is the new covenant that the Lord will make. He will put his laws in our minds and in our hearts. Just make a little bit of room here. Now these will be not only the moral law, but also the health laws. So the moral laws, but also the health laws. And we can say too, environment laws. The laws that God uses to keep our bodies in health, our moral laws, the law of Ten Commandments, our health laws, our bodies in health, this is our minds and our spirits, our bodies, sorry, and then environmental laws, the area around us in health too. And these things will be written on our hearts when we are following Jesus closely. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbour, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So the truth will become widely known and accepted by God's people as we come right to the end of time. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he said, a new covenant he hath made the first old, 
Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So the situation at the end of time is that God, through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, will teach us personally the law of Ten Commandments, the moral law, but also the laws of health and the environmental laws. Now included in the moral laws will be the laws of helping others to love God supremely, but then we are to love our neighbours as ourselves. And these laws of loving our neighbours of ourselves will extend a helping hand to those around us who are suffering. Now this whole world has become a laser house of suffering in these last days. And this suffering is going to increase as time goes on. And this is because God's laws have been disregarded. But a part of the work of God's servants in these last days is to extend this helping hand to those who are in need and to represent the character of Jesus in all they do and say and act. So, therefore, they shall not teach every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So I think we shall um, go now to verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and just finish with one or two thoughts. No, verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, so as in a glass, when we behold the glory of the Lord, we look at that glory. And that glory is reflected back upon us as we look at it, if we look at it in the right way. In other words, if we accept the revelation of God's character that's given in the life of Jesus, and that reflecting back upon ourselves changes us in character too. And we reflect that image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. So that glory shining upon us will increase our desire to minister to our brothers and sisters in need. And... In that ministering to them in need, then we become like Jesus in character as we manifest that love towards others and as we give out the love, God will give more into us. And then that cycle will begin, the cycle of receiving from the Lord, receiving from brethren, also who are in the faith and giving to those in need. And those in need will, in turn, once they're helped, will also give to others as well. Now, this is the cycle that we see that is the cycle of life. So we'll leave it with that thought that life is represented in a cycle the cycle of life. And that cycle is summed up very beautifully in the thought of receiving and giving to receive again. So we receive from God 
here we are here. We give to others. And others give back to God again. And sometimes others will give to us and God will give to us and also we will give to God. And this is a cycle which will go on and on and become more interwoven and more complex as it goes on. But those who give shall be looked after by God, as we know from Isaiah 58 and other places. So let's stop there and remember that God is all-powerful. He's able to achieve in our lives what he has designed that we should achieve and that we should cooperate with him to bring that change about. That is my prayer and my supplication in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.